All societies have been shaped by the struggle to control water. From the first civilizations in the Middle East and Asia to the mega cities of our days. The future of humankind will also be shaped by the unruly element of water. In the next decades, huge water projects will radically change the face of the earth. A new uncertainty will force all societies to ask, do we live in the age of droughts or in the age of floods? We can't cope with all this water in the old-fashioned way. I hope uh, God will do something <laughs> to save us. The struggle for control over water will increasingly hold the balance between peace and war and profoundly influence relations between countries and continents. What makes war start? Fights over water, changing patterns of rainfall, fights over food production, land use. This is an issue that threatens the peace and security of the whole planet. I have traveled down the great rivers, have seen water in all its forms and dimensions, and have met national leaders and water experts all over the world. For years, I've been researching and writing on the history of water. Now I invite you to join me on a global journey into the future of water. Because no one, absolutely no one, can escape the power of water. The human race has achieved dominance over all other animals in a period characterized by unusually stable climatic conditions. But are these ideal conditions, which have lasted for 10,000 years, about to end? We live in what we can call an age of climatic uncertainty, in an age where uncertainty over the future of water will dominate political life. It will have enormous consequences on our societies. This is Dogon country in Mali. Here, on the edge of the Sahara, people have for generations adapted to the local hydrological cycle. Very little water most of the time, with occasional exceptions. They know that changes in water conditions will again and again afflict their way of life and threaten the existence of their villages. Normality here is lack of any stability. This lake comes and goes every year. Local myths say that when the rains come, the fish are flushed out of the adjacent mountain. Lake Antogo is the location of a special fishery and a unique fertility ritual. Thousands travel long distances to take part in the fishing. Right now, the water level is ideal. Everyone is waiting for the signal to start. In a matter of minutes, there are no fish left in the lake, and soon the lake itself will also be gone. Seen in a long historical context of climatic conditions, this annual event in Lake Antogo can serve as a symbol over the human race's powerlessness 
when confronted with the hydrological cycle. The lake is a metaphor and a barometer of water's eternal capriciousness. Are we at the threshold of a century of drought or of a century of rain and floods? Will the world's oceans rise and how much? No one knows the right answers to these complex questions. Every society will be affected by this new and fundamental uncertainty over changes in the water landscape of the future. Severe drought or serious flooding either can be fatal to millions of people in poor countries. Uncertainty as to tomorrow's water conditions will also pose huge, unfamiliar challenges to the world's most advanced societies. These challenges will affect international relations, migration patterns, and the position of democracy all over the world. the Yellow River, the river that has been so central in the drama of China's past. Passing the birthplace of the Xi'an dynasty and its terracotta warriors. The new train sweats its way up to the world's largest mountain plateau. On our second day, we are at 5,000 meters above sea level. Uncertainty over water's future will place this desolate area right in the middle of Asia's development and political rivalry. From this plateau flow the Yangtze, Mekong, Brahmaputra, Indus, Salween, and Ganges rivers, vital lifelines to almost 3 billion people. How much water flows in these rivers in the dry season, in India, China, and all the other countries that are dependent on them, is to a large extent determined by what happens in the Himalayas. For Tibet is Asia's water tower. 40 to 50 million years ago, the India subcontinent collided with the rest of Asia's landmass. Lofty mountain peaks were pushed up, and in the previous century, the Himalayas were a symbol for eternal ice and snow. Then, not so many years ago, the first alarms were raised. The ice that has been here for eons is beginning to melt and fast. The glaciers that have underpinned civilization so steadfastly, are they about to disappear? This is where Asia's water banks lie, 5,000 meters above sea level. There are 15,000 glaciers. If all of them melt, the consequences will be catastrophic. Surrounded by high mountains, in a burning hot sand dune on the banks of the Brahmaputra, we are as near the truth of Tibet's future position as we can get. For large parts of Tibet, a mountain desert. And in central Tibet, there are only between 25 and 50 millimeters of rainfall a year. In spite of this, 10 huge rivers, all crucial to civilization's history, rise here. They have shaped Asia's history for thousands of years. Concentration. Mm. Yeah. But this is a temperature. temperature. Yeah. Yao Tang Dong, one of China's leading glaciologists, is an expert on what is happening in Tibet. A lot of glaciers will disappear. 
Firstly, small glaciers, even in the next 50 years, some glaciers disappear. That's for sure. But uh, around the 2,100, most of glaciers, small glaciers will disappear. The annual glacier shrinkage roughly equals in volume the total annual water flow in the Yellow River. 2,100. We don't think that we have uh, enough water resource. I think some oases will be disappear. Yao and his colleagues are closely monitoring a development that threatens to transform the lives of the majority of the people in the world. If their predictions are right, then these vital lifelines will be completely changed. After a period of flooding, the rivers will become pale shadows of their former selves. Hundreds of millions of people will be affected, and many of them will be forced to leave their homes. This is the Brahmaputra River, also known as the Yalung Zangpo, one of the many rivers having their source in Tibet. The Tibetans have rowed their yak skin boats on the river for generations, ignorant of the river's significance for a whole continent and untouched by the maelstrom of world politics. The new age of the uncertainty of water will turn this river into an agent of world historic importance. The water problem is already challenging India's unity and development. Conflicts of interest will be sharpened with a reduced discharge in the 37 rivers flowing into India from the Himalayas. The Indus, the lifeline of Pakistan and its all-important agriculture, rises in Tibet and 90% of its water comes from glaciers. If they melt, Pakistan will be in desperate straits. The Mekong River will continue to play a vital role in Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Thailand and Burma. And for low-lying Bangladesh astride a river delta, consequences will be fatal if the glaciers melt. The Chinese government has already stated that a looming water crisis is a major threat to China's development. Changes in the flow of their crucial rivers will deepen this crisis and have far-reaching consequences. if the glaciers do not melt, and it turns out that the relationship between climate and water flow is far more complex than prophecies comprehended. This new uncertainty would then already have cast a long shadow over the future of the whole region and impacted relations among states. Tibetan Buddhists kneeling before the country's most sacred building, as they have done for hundreds of years, will undoubtedly experience that they live in one of the world's most important strategic areas. Tibet's new role as a water bank is here to stay because the new age of uncertainty is going to last a very long time. because it's not just the Himalayan glaciers that are melting. Reports suggest that they are shrinking all over the world, such as here in the Alps of Central Europe. 
Some scientists predict that all glaciers not higher than 2,000 meters above sea level will be gone by 2070. What will become of the Netherlands, Europe's most densely populated country, with most of its southwestern part a series of river deltas? It will be a formidable task to protect the land from river water, since 60% of the Netherlands lies below sea level. No other country has taken the new uncertainty more seriously, or come further in adapting to anticipated dramatic changes in water conditions. One of Europe's busiest airports lies six meters below sea level. In the middle of the 19th century, one of the largest steam engines in the world pumped up many hundred million cubic meters of water where there is now a runway. This is not a natural river, but an artificial canal. Dug by hand, over a hundred years ago. It's 63 kilometers long, and its job was to get rid of excess water. Without this canal, there could never have been a Schiphol airport. But the canal also illustrates the vulnerability of the Netherlands. The Dutch government, fearful of much more rain and more water in its canals and rivers, has already initiated a new water policy. Time and again, flooding has struck, but the authorities now fear that climate changes will create a fundamental imbalance in the water management system assiduously developed over the centuries. God created the world, man, created the Netherlands. These are the words of the philosopher Descartes 400 years ago. He was right, for the country is the product of a massive, centuries-long engineering project. The Netherlanders' extraordinary goal has been to wrest their country from the grip of water. Accordingly, the primary task of their windmills has not been to grind corn, but to pump up water from fields into thousands of drainage canals. For hundreds of years, rotating sails and gurgling water provided the background music to the Netherlands' development. But windmills will be totally inadequate in a future battle against rising rivers and more rain. The struggle with water has traditionally mobilized the whole nation. This is Kees van Velen. He is a rat catcher. This has become his mission in life. I'm searching every meter. I'm looking for vegetation who is left behind by the muskrat. Yes, there's a big one. I want to save our country for a big disaster. When those muskrat dig in these dikes and all the soil and comes into the water, the dikes collapse and there will be streaming much of water in those polders, so there will be a big disaster. He is one of about 400 rat catchers, who between them kill almost 250,000 water rats every year. The Netherlands' most important defence against water is, however, the thousands of pumps that work day and night all over the country. In no other country in the world 
Are water pumps the nerve center of national life? They will have to pump forever, and it is feared more and more water. It has become evident that 1,430 kilometers of dikes and the most efficient river management system in the world are not sufficient. There's coming more and more water from uh, the big rivers, from the Rhine, from the Maas. We have more and more heavy rainfall as a result of climate change. We have to find new solutions, new policy to take care of all the water problems. The government reckons that water flow in the Rhine and Maas rivers will increase by 40% at certain times of the year. This will not only threaten agriculture, but also towns and cities and the increasingly busy river transport. We can't cope with all this water in the old-fashioned way. Imagine uh, small rivers between uh, uh, high dikes and even higher and higher dikes in the future. It will be a big problem. Uh, the power of the river is too strong. It's a dangerous situation. This is a country where water management has for several hundred years been conducted through locally elected committees with considerable power. But now the state is saying that the dikes must be destroyed and land given back to water. We will give a, a part of our land back to the water. That's very difficult because historically we always fought the water. Now we have to live with it, that's our motto. Live with water instead of fighting against it. It creates a more safe situation. Safety for some generally means less safety for others. In Dordrecht, the future has already arrived. The whole area is to be inundated. Stan and Yvonne are two of the farmers who must leave hard-fought for land. 25 years ago, they uh, made this land new for us. So at first we thought that it can be possible. We call it the Winterdijk. It protects us against the high water from the river. The plan is now to lower the dike so the water from the river can come this side, into the polder. And they said it would be three meters high. So uh, then we have to protect us against that water. We have to put our farms uh, at a higher level. And we don't like it, but yeah, uh, it's all for the people in the big cities. Even so, many experts think the government's measures are totally inadequate. The new age of water uncertainty has definitely reached Europe. In the Netherlands, they have also begun to plan floating cities and a new major airport in the sea. But the main reason for such plans is another anticipated change in water conditions. Fear of rising sea levels within the next few years has turned an ice wilderness into a hotspot of world politics. The east coast of Greenland is one of the most isolated places in the world. Along the 2,600 kilometer coastline live about 3,500 people. Because of ice-covered water in the fjord, the local population can only reach the outside world by sea five months of the year. Nevertheless, it is this outpost of civilization, and not New York or Brussels or Beijing, that holds the key to forecasting the future of the human race. The world's largest island has about 10% of the world's fresh water in the form of ice. 
the inland ice cap covers an area the size of England and in some places it is three kilometers thick. We know that the Greenland ice cap has been stable for the last 10,000 years. But will this last? And if not, what will be the global consequences? In the remote Sermlik Fjord, I meet two scientists who have been carrying out research here for almost 30 years. Unnoticed by the outside world, they have studied and calibrated the evolution of one of the smaller glaciers. Now, they are frontline soldiers in an ever-increasing army of climate researchers. Here stood isen in 1958, and helt the up bag we stood in 1970. And now stood it helt the up, and we can see it. And we reckon that it will disappear up bag with a tempo of 10 meters a month. They show us their monitoring stations. Bent measures meltwater flow and the amount of sludge. The results show that runoff from the glacier is increasing. Nils monitors snow conditions on the glacier in order to better understand the relationship between temperature, precipitation, and ice melting. The two Danish scientists can neither confirm nor rebut the most pessimistic forecasts. Altså de målinger vi har lavet på isen viser jo at den smelter hurtigt tilbage. Der er så nogle diskussioner om ikke også indlandsisen nu er ved at smelte tilbage, men måske noget af paradoxet i det at en opvarmning og en tilbagesmelding nogle steder af indlandsisen får den faktisk til at rykke frem andre steder. But everyone seems to agree that if all the ice melts, the ocean level will rise by between five and seven meters. And that long before this will happen, the colder fresh water in the ocean will dramatically affect ocean currents. There is a global contest for supremacy among competing climate change predictions, with enormous consequences for power relations and economic development. The UN Climate Panel considers it will take 500 to 2,000 years for the ice to melt, and that the ocean will rise by between 50 and 80 centimeters by 2,100. Others argue that these prophecies are far too alarmist. Scientists at NASA, however, maintain that the glacier meltdown is much more rapid than expected and that it can all melt within 200 years. These scientists are studying the meltwater beneath the ice cap. The water digs out large tunnels. Deep wells are formed. If the streams increase in size, the ice will flow more rapidly into the sea than UN predictions envisage, claim some scientists. The gurgle of running water under the glacier, is this a warning bell for mankind's future? The cautious overture to a rise of ocean levels? Or could it also be the sound of Greenland's coming economic adventure? Not everyone on Greenland considers warmer weather to be a catastrophe. Some see new opportunities. Power stations using meltwater can be profitable businesses. The first one is already being built. Certainly, nothing in this modest architecture suggests this is the first step along a revolutionary path. 
but if the enormous amount of ice starts cascading down from the mountains as running water, Greenland can become a hydroelectric giant. In the 1970s, plans for artificially melting the ice to provide hydropower here were discussed. Now, many people see no need for this. And what riches are hidden under the ice? Should it melt, the great powers are sure to turn their attention to Greenland, and Denmark's hold on the island will end up a thing of the past. Changes in climate and water conditions, or expectations of such changes, will not rally all mankind round the common cause of the planet's future. For current thinking about mankind's predicament is sometimes naive and ignores the fact that while there will be many losers, there will also be some people who profit from changes in global and local water conditions. from an island which, in spite of being an icy waste, will have a decisive political importance in world affairs in the not too distant future. For such is the nature of the new uncertainty. One of the places that has already accepted the consequences of the melting of Greenland's ice cap is this city of canals in northern Italy, built on wooden piles in a lagoon in the Adriatic Sea. The fate of this city is a telling lesson on how uncertainty about water can affect politics. If the sea level rises as fast as some people predict, Venice will soon drown in the very lagoon that gave birth to it. In a control room in the center of the city, Water conditions are monitored non-stop. When parts of central Venice are in danger of being flooded, the alarm goes. It is very disturbing to walk on these catwalks past Venice's old and beautiful buildings. This is St. Mark's Square in the very heart of the city. The square is underwater ten times more often now than a hundred years ago. At the turn of the century, the Italian government issued a warning. The climate change would lead to the city being totally covered by water by 2050, unless something drastic was done. The Venetians have always struggled with water and with the consequences of their measures to manage it. The city and the lagoon it is built on were formed by the Adriatic and the three large rivers flowing into it. Waves and river silt built up hundreds of tiny islands where people eventually settled. In the 14th century, the rivers were being diverted outside the city to reduce the danger of flooding and to keep the water level in the lagoon down. In the 1980s, to stop the sinking of the city, the pumping up of groundwater was banned. In this perspective, the current challenges are simply variations on the familiar theme of water-city relations. Now, the problem is the rising sea level.
Silvio Berlusconi's government initiated a radical project to save the city. Full of technological optimism, they called it Project Moses. The modern Moses will also divide the waters, but engineers will determine how. Three river mouths separate the lagoon from the sea and protect the city from the Adriatic. Twice a day, tidewater cleans the lagoon. This makes it impossible simply to shut out the sea. The answer was a sort of swing gate. 79 undersea gates on the lagoon bed will prevent the high tides from entering the city. Local environmentalist groups and authorities have been opposed to the project. Un innalzamento come temuto, 20, 25, 30 centimetri attorno alla metà fine secolo, è ovvio che questo progetto non è più un progetto adeguato, non è più un progetto che consente di affrontare un simile fenomeno. They consider the whole project ill-equipped to keep the sea out and think it will ruin the lagoon's vulnerable ecology. Critics accuse the Italian government of exploiting alarm over climate change to push this prestige project through as a showcase for Italian industry and technology. Disagreement in Italy over the Moses project is symptomatic of what the situation will be all over the world. We are all doomed to shape the society of the future by acting on the basis of prophecies about the future of water. On the Maldive Islands, the government has built an artificial island, Hulhumale. It's one and a half meters above sea level. 125,000 people can live here, about half the island's population. A modern Noah's Ark for water refugees. If the sea level rises more than one and a half meters, they must build higher and higher. If the Greenland ice cap melts, cities like New York and London will be threatened. If the Antarctic melts, the ocean level will rise 61 meters. Only prophets of doom argue that this will happen, and if it does, it'll be in the very distant future. Leaving Venice's lagoon, enclosed in December fog, it's easy to acknowledge the fear of one of the possible tyrants of the future, the rising ocean level. There's another danger. Democracy is at stake. Societies that fail to prepare adequately for catastrophe will be more likely to accept authoritarian rule when catastrophe materializes. And the more people fear catastrophe, the more willing they will be to accept authoritarian measures to avert it. I know of no other country whose population density is more overwhelming than in Bangladesh. Nearly 150 million people packed together on a small river plain. In 2050, a hundred million more people will live here. Even so, this highly fertile river delta has made economic progress in recent years. But the people here are caught up in a trap, in a hydrological squeeze. No other country is, to the same extent, situated on the cusp between two deadly tyrannies. Rising ocean level and rising rivers, a dire predicament.
If the Himalayan glaciers melt, there will first be a period of more water in the rivers crossing Bangladesh on their way to the coast. Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna, three mighty rivers goes through this line into the Bay of Bengal. As they go down into the sea with such a tremendous force, then they erode the area. So as a result, thousands of people become homeless every year. Millions of people have been mobilized in the battle to meet the normal rampages of these rivers, but they have not been successful. During the normal annual flooding, a quarter of the country is underwater. During extraordinary flooding, 70% of the country has been underwater. Of all the world's societies that have grown up around the river delta, none is as vulnerable as Bangladesh. Extremely rapid population growth combined with weak central government control, has resulted in the building of roads and houses in low-lying flood plains. The country has made itself increasingly vulnerable to floods at the same time as the likelihood of flooding has increased. With 80% of its land lying less than 10 meters above sea level, the prospect of a rising sea is a nightmare for Bangladesh. Were the ocean to rise just half a metre, more than six million people would lose the land they live on. Were it to rise one and a half metres, at least 17 millions would lose their land. Rising ocean levels carry another more furtive threat. Salt water will seep in and destroy the groundwater. And where will all those whose source of livelihood has been destroyed go? This will create a great imbalance on the situation in this whole region because our land would not be able to hold so many people who are uprooted from their houses. So they will naturally spill into the neighboring countries and become jobless. Uncertainty jeopardizes investment and planning and weakens the state's resolve to act. The feeling of powerlessness has created a special political climate of fatalism. People prefer to leave difficult decisions to others. A small, developing country like Bangladesh cannot uh, cope up with this kind of disaster. But it's better the big powers today's, the G7 and uh, the major powers, United Nations, they should take into account because it's a global problem. The solution should come globally. If the international community doesn't come up, we leave it to the God. Allah will save us. This is what we feel. downplaying one's local responsibility will become a staple feature of world politics, since it'll become more and more common to blame local water insecurity on the industrial countries of the West. Bangladesh is a country that must develop in the shadow of this new uncertainty about climate and water. And history is full of examples of civilizations that collapsed when faced with changes in water's behavior. The ancient Indus civilization in what is today Pakistan and India and the Sumerian civilization along the Tigris and Euphrates collapsed partly because water let them down. Same happened with the Maya Indian civilization of South America. In 
an ecological park, not far from all the tourist hotels on the Riviera Maya in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, the Maya civilization is being reconstructed as a tourist attraction. It should also be seen as a historical warning. The Maya civilization stood for 1,200 years. At its height, it stretched from Guatemala in the south to Mexico in the north and included 40 cities and a total of 2 million inhabitants. It's now clear changes in climate and water conditions interacting with social and political conditions caused the demise of the old centers of this civilization. Maya agriculture was largely based on artificial dams filled with rainwater. When rainfall failed for a period of several years, about 1,200 years ago, this speeded up a process of decay that culminated in the core areas south of the Yucatan Peninsula being depopulated. They were reclaimed by the jungle. But in the Yucatan Peninsula, a weakened form of the civilization survived. At its center stood the pyramid in Chichen Itza. The name means the mouth of the water sorcerer as well. This serves as a reminder of the economic and cultural importance of water. Here, around Chichen Itza, parts of Maya civilization survived. Water conditions were different here. They had synodes. This is a typical cenote, a freshwater sinkhole or well. There were no normal rivers here, no lakes either, and they lived in semi-desert. Their societies depended upon 3,000 or so permanent sinkholes. Cenotes are only found in Yucatan and have been for Yucatan what the Nile has been for Egypt. The sinkholes were formed when limestone fell in. It's easy to see why these natural cathedrals became centers of a religious cult. They were venerated as the Earth's stomach and as the watery doorway to the underworld's rain gods. Therefore, they were also places of sacrifice especially to placate the rain gods. Humans were sacrificed by being pushed into the sinkholes, never to reappear. The sinkholes are the visible part of an extensive network of underground waterways. What we have here is the entrance to one of the largest underground river systems in the world. It stretches for many kilometers under the Yucatan Peninsula. These rivers provide the sinkholes with a constant supply of water. Prior to the ice melting at the end of the last ice age, these were empty caves. We know that because the stalactites we can see could not have been formed without dry air. When the ice melted, the ocean level rose and the caves were gradually filled with water. The Maya civilization is an example of how changes in water conditions have had far-reaching consequences for social developments. We must ask, will modern society prove better equipped to tackle the vagaries of water? In literature, World literature is full of accounts of how the gods have punished human frailty 
with drought or floods. Prophecies of catastrophic changes in water conditions caused by human action have therefore a deep global cultural resonance. What is new is that they are justified by the arguments of rational science and that the politicians have taken the place of the gods. The overriding question will be, will politicians succeed in controlling the vagaries of water and their consequences? And what will happen to societies when people start demanding a new government because of bad weather, drought or too much water? <laughs>